Check this shit out. On this channel, I primarily focus on the Nintendo Entertainment System and the 700 or so titles that comprise its official library of games. At first, I just wanted to highlight some of the more obscure titles, which included some poorly programmed castaways, some rare late releases, and some surprisingly neglected hidden gems. As someone who collects cartridges that were available at the time that the Nintendo was in production, as well as within the region that I grew up in, which was the United States, this channel has focused primarily on the games that I could have potentially purchased as a kid. And because of that inherent bias, I started to get questions about my thought process. Why focus only on the official games for the NES? Why not include unlicensed games in these discussions? What about the various bootleg titles out there, or even more recent homebrews, that is, Nintendo games that people are making as we speak? And especially, what about the titles for the Family Computer, or Famicom, the name for the Nintendo in Japan, which accounts for hundreds more games that never made it to North America? Well, those are all valid points, but I believe they lead to an even more important question about this iconic console, which is, what is the Nintendo Entertainment System? And I know how stupid that sounds, but really, what defines its lifespan? its game libraries, and its hardware, and how do those parameters change the way we critically talk about it, both historically and in modern times? Do we need to discuss these games by region, by time period, by official versus unofficial releases, or do we need to talk about this more holistically? Well, in this video, I'm going to try and answer those questions by giving context to how the NES was experienced at the time it was released, how its library grew as media shifted from physical to digital, and how its legacy has changed over time from a static state of nostalgia to an ever-evolving complement to the world of modern gaming. To do this, I'm going to give a bit of my own personal background with the console, review the types of games that qualify as NES, and then bring it all together to discuss how we could talk about this retro system in modern terms. I am a collector of NES games and have been since the 16-bit era passed me by and my friends started to give me their unwanted old carts. At the time, the quality of games or even the existence of them was shared to us through very specific ways. Either you saw certain titles reviewed or advertised for in magazines like Nintendo Power, spotted them for sale or for rent in toy and video stores, or your friends owned them and let you experience them firsthand. I had probably 15 cartridges, which was a ton at the time, and between those games I owned and the others I'd rented or played, there were probably 50 titles or so that I experienced during the Nintendo's heyday. Even then, I never tried some of the more famous games like Metroid, Final Fantasy, or even Contra till years later, let alone stuff I wasn't aware of at all like Blaster Master, River City Ransom, or Crystalis. At some point in the early 2000s, I got into emulation, which opened up the doors to a whole world of titles I'd never experienced before. It's then that I finally sat down and played stuff like Mega Man 2, Maniac Mansion, and Castlevania, games I'd heard of but never tried. At the time, faced with hundreds of options, I definitely played through a few random games here and there, but I didn't sit down and go through them all. The internet was still in its unorganized infancy, so even if I wanted to learn about some of the more banal titles in its library, websites with comprehensive guides to games or game libraries just did not exist at the time. As such, despite my unfettered access to them, hundreds of titles still lingered in obscurity. As I got older and NES carts started popping up in thrift stores, I began collecting again. As I continued to amass titles, and as the internet grew from a clunky collection of 100 character long web links to a more streamlined and accessible source of information, I began to also absorb the opinions of other retro game enthusiasts. I began to see many top 10, top 20, or top 100 lists of the best NES games out there. These rankings introduced me to not only a huge amount of titles I'd never been aware of, but over time they also began to shape my understanding about what the best NES games were according to the collective fanbase. As such, I began to collect more and more, attempting to acquire all the cartridges featured on these lists in order to have a more thorough library of the top Nintendo titles. Wikipedia has a list of every game released on the system, and while that can meander a bit into unofficial titles and some geographical separations like games that were only localized to Europe, if you're someone like me who grew up playing the NES, it's the ultimate cheat sheet to understanding the finite amount of titles that define this iconic video game console. If you checked every game off that list and played it in whatever form was available to you, you reached the end of the Nintendo's library. How much more is there to know or play? 
for me at that moment in time, was where the nostalgic view of the Nintendo Entertainment System ended. When you've taken into account everyone's opinions on those games, whether based on their personal experience or research, how much more discussion is necessary before it just feels like we're retreading the same ground? Well, in the mid-2010s, right when YouTube was really starting to hit its stride, I started to see more divergence in the community's critical view of the NES library. All of a sudden, I'd see best NES games lists that included Famicom titles that never left Japan. Unless you traveled abroad in the 80s or 90s, or perhaps lived in one of those liminal areas like Hawaii or Eastern Europe, where for various reasons Japanese goods or knockoff Japanese goods were plentiful, how would you know about these games at the time they were released? There weren't any commercials for Holy Diver or Moon Crystal in the Saved by the Bell era. Well, over time, as the internet widened our access to the world and its cultures, more and more people learned about the Famicom and its library. Suddenly everyone knew that Mario 2 was actually Doki Doki Panic in disguise, and that Final Fantasy 2 on the Super Nintendo was actually Final Fantasy 4 because the real Final Fantasy 2 was a different game that was only released on the family computer. In the discussion about the NES and what games were its finest, Famicom exclusive titles that didn't require any knowledge of Japanese started to appear in many of the top games lists I'd see. Crazier than that though is that the ROM community grew and grew. Not only could you play every game compatible with the NES, Famicom, or any clone of either, but dedicated wizards were translating the Japanese-only titles and releasing English-language versions so that Western audiences could experience them in a manner similar to their Eastern counterparts. In 1990, there was little chance a consumer in Canada would know about the original Fire Emblem as it only appeared on the Famicom, but in 2011, suddenly you could play it at home just like you popped down to Blockbuster and checked it out for the weekend. And it wasn't just the Japanese games that joined the fray. Now all kinds of bizarre bootlegs could be played through emulation, including hacks, that is altered versions of existing games which were reprogrammed to make new ones, as well as bizarre demakes of 16-bit titles like the Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat NES games, or even stuff like Super Mario World and later Final Fantasy VII. And there is a massive amount of these strange Frankensteins out there where Mario has ninja skills, or runs like Sonic, or even beats up Toad in a 1v1 fighter. And then these hacks and bootlegs bled into what's become the most interesting aspect of the NES, which is the ROM hacking and homebrew communities. In recent years, enthusiasts broke down their favorite titles and built them back up into entirely new experiences, giving Nintendo fans fresh takes on Metroid, Zelda, and Mario games to name a few. They also produced improvements to already existing titles that either balanced the difficulty or added some quality of life stuff like more clear dialogue in Simon's Quest or the ability to change weapons in Ghosts and Goblins. Homebrews are even more impressive as they're entirely new games built through traditional coding methods or by using programs like Nestmaker. Like the hacks, they can vary in quality depending on the creator, but there are a ton of these out there to try, some of which I'd say that if they were released in 1989, would have been considered all-time greats on the system. So that's a brief history of all the different things that could be considered games for the Nintendo Entertainment System, and how wildly the console's library has grown over time. To recap, there's the official games that only came out in North America, the unlicensed titles only released when the NES was still in production, then there's the Nintendo games that were only sold in Europe and Australia, then there's the Japanese library of Famicom games, which in turn could be compartmentalized even further between titles where knowing the language is not a problem, games where understanding Japanese is essential, and then whatever is happening with the titles exclusive to the Famicom disk system. Additionally, there's all the bootlegs and unreleased games that showed up on these mystery cartridges throughout Eastern Europe and Asia after the Famicom slash NES was no longer in production. And finally, there's the homebrews and hacks that were made by people recently that are usually experienced as digital ROMs, but often sold as cartridges that work on the Nintendos. These included improvements of old games, new titles using existing elements from NES games, translations of foreign language titles, and all new unique games. Okay, so that's the entire breadth of the Nintendo's library from 1983 to present. And for sure, the types of games and the ways that we can play them has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. So then the question is, how do we discuss the NES today? Is it through the lens of the people who grew up in the 80s and 90s and experienced this as a physical and finite set of games? Or does that discussion become more expansive to include the digital era? Or furthermore, the current evolving landscape of how titles can be played, altered, or even created today? 
I believe that the NES follows a three-part critical path when discussing its library. Depending on your age, experience with the system, and general obsessiveness, you probably view the console through one of these three differing lenses. First is a nostalgic overview, which is based on the experiences of people who played this system at the time it was released, and is largely based on the games that they physically owned or rented. This is a very populist perspective that tends to skew toward favoring the best-selling and best-advertised for titles. Like if you ask your friends about their favorite NES titles from back in the day, are they going to mention Kickle Cubicle, Metal Storm, and Little Samson? Or are they going to say Tetris, Double Dribble, and Dr. Mario? In many ways, this is the clearest take on what about the NES was popular at the time. Kind of like listening to an oldie station that only plays the same 50 songs on repeat, but man, those are some familiar jams. However, looking at the Nintendo in this way can be incredibly narrow, giving high regard to the most popular and well-known titles in the library, including some that, let's face it, really weren't that great or influential. And while it tends to exclude a lot of good but lesser played gems, it also leaves out the entirety of the official titles released in other parts of the world. The second is a more historical view, which looks at every game in the Nintendo catalog and compares them based on quality as much as influence or popularity. Critically, you might say that games like Bucky O'Hare and Mighty Final Fight deserve to be in the same conversation as Mega Man and Double Dragon, but not necessarily that they are better than their more famous counterparts. Mario 3 may still be the people and critics' choice, but there's less room for the Bill and Ted's and more space for the Gargoyles Quest 2's. This take not only looks at the NES library as a complete set of games by comparing deep cuts with more well-known classics, but also begins to incorporate what else was available at the time, including titles from around the world that didn't require any foreign language skills to play. This is, in my opinion, the most balanced take on the Nintendo, marrying ideas of nostalgia with exploration and context to give a more comprehensive view, but also limiting the scope of conversation to games within a certain time period or language. And then there's a the third perspective, where everyone's welcome to the party. We're now several generations removed from the introduction of this iconic system, and the internet is no longer just web browsing. Our views on how to discuss media are in a state of constant flux, as apps and algorithms move and shape our experiences and opinions. Any game ever released, whether officially or unofficially, is available to us in seconds, and can be played on various platforms, in various gameplay formats, and in various languages. A postmodernist approach would be to say that the NES does not need historic context, and should only be judged on what games are fun or not. So why not say that the Japanese-only Final Fantasy III is the best 8-bit RPG on the system, or that the unreleased Time Diver Eon Man is superior to Ninja Gaiden, or that the homebrew Micro Mages is a better co-op experience than Bubble Bobble? This approach excuse stuff like sales data or media presence, and especially nostalgia, in favor of a thought process that's more, all things being equal, what do I really like? And the answer is there is no one way to talk about a console's library. It can be discussed in any of the ways that I just described, or through some combination of criteria. I personally always talked about the NES as the official North American games, only because it fits my nostalgic perspective, as well as my collector's perspective. But I also love playing Famicom exclusives, and weird Taiwanese bootlegs, and Zelda randomizers, and something that could have been an OG game but wasn't made until just now. I just choose to judge them as their own Nintendo categories instead of placing them in the same conversation with the cartridges I could have bought at Toys R Us 30 years ago. So much of that is based on my age, and I would guess that if you're 10, 20, or even 30 years younger than me, that you experience the NES and all past media in an entirely different way than I do. But I do think if you're someone like me whose hobby is waxing on about their favorite childhood console, or watching this and wishing to discuss the pitfalls and greatness of its library, that you need to have some parameters set when making comparative criticisms. If I were to talk about a specific genre of film, art, music, or literature that existed in a particular time or place, and then come back and say that a brand new form of media also fit into that category, there would be some resistance to the idea. To do so without acknowledging the history and legacy of those movements would be a huge disservice all around. But alternately, to exclude new media from the conversation means that it is a closed discussion, and therefore no new ideas can be added. Likewise, when talking about the games played for the NES, regardless of when or where they originated, 
everything needs to be contextualized so that the conversation is defined on how broad or narrow its scope will be. That way the hardcore enthusiasts and throwback casuals can engage in the same form without one or the other feeling excluded. I can't tell you how long I've been muttering to myself about this topic, so it's nice to finally put it out there in video form. If it resonated with any of y'all, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to continue the discussion. Massive shout out to my man Mike, who recently joined my Patreon and for whom I've made this Batman inspired sign. I'm Mike Man. Thanks dude, it means a lot. If you want to clown around with Mike and the other cool guys, head on over to patreon.com slash words where I'm posting weekly bonus videos. I've made a similar video to this one about the three eras of the NES, which took me an equally long amount of rewriting to complete, so if you haven't seen that, there's a link over here somewhere. Otherwise, until next time, thanks for watching.